I appreciate uh, so many of you have, have uh, encouraged me by saying how much you're looking forward to this study through the book of James. Um, it's been a while coming. I announced that a long time ago. And the Lord took me different places before today. So we begin uh, the message in the Mass. I really like that title. That's actually also the title of our Pioneer Club theme for the rest of this year as we look at family and how God uh, ministered to and through messy families to get his message uh, of the gospel to bring that about. Um, we see the same thing here in the book of James. What I want to do to begin today is I'm going to read a, a short passage of Scripture. I'm not going to tell you where it's at, okay? I'm not going to give you the reference, but I want you to look at the words and uh, kind of locate this verse in history just based on the collection of words that are there without knowing the reference, okay? Here it is. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Okay, you don't know where that is located in your Bible. Some of you probably do already, but let's locate it just in history. Uh, how many of you know for sure, based on the words used there, that this isn't uh, like from Genesis? Or it's not the time of Abraham? Or How do you know? Give me a phrase that tells you it's not in Abraham's day, for example. What's that? The church. the church. Yeah, there was no church in Abraham's day. The church, the ecclesia, puts that in history where? Post-resurrection. You're right. New Testament, post-resurrection. Here it says, all except the apostles. What were they called when Jesus was alive? Disciples. Here they're called apostles. So that tells you something there. Also, post-resurrection, these are the disciples of Christ that are now the apostles of Christ. And it says the church was scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So let me, let me kind of give it away now. I'm going to read to you the next verse. It's on your screen right now. Verse 2, it says, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Okay, some of you know what book we're in now, don't you? What is it? It's the book of Acts. This is 36 A.D.E., three years after Jesus' resurrection, somewhere around that time. And the passage is Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Stephen, he was a spirit-filled, bold servant of Jesus. He had been killed. He had been murdered by the unbelieving Jews of Jerusalem. They had stoned him to death. The end of chapter 7 in the book of Acts describes Stephen's end. He had minced no words as he laid out the work of God in Israel's history before uh, his listeners. He revealed that God revealed and invited his chosen people of Israel to come near throughout their history, but come near to God they would not. And Stephen rehearsed Israel's unbelief and idolatry and her persecution of the prophets how they longed, how the Israelites longed to be like and alongside the pagan nations around her. And Stephen's final words in his monologue were a scathing rebuke that had almost that almost demonically enraged the hard hearts of these people. Acts seven fifty one. Here's what he said: "You stiff necked people, your hearts and ears are still." Still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. I'd say that's pretty bold, wouldn't you? So they stoned him. They threw stones and rocks, some very large, at him 
until he died. In chapter 7 and verse 59 says, While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, some of you may know this historically better than I. I did not study this aspect of it. So I'm a little bit spitballing here just for a few seconds. I've always read that the Jews during Jesus' day were not allowed to carry out sentences of capital punishment. This is three years after Jesus. That only the Romans could do so. And that's why the Jews took Jesus to, to Pontius Pilate to try and get him to do the dirty work. Now, I don't know at this point, just a few years after that, if that policy had changed here in 36 AD with Stephen. Uh, perhaps the Romans, rather than, than punish the murderers of Stephen at this point, maybe they just kind of look the other way and, and, and maybe this wink and a nod on behalf of Rome emboldened the Jews to increase their persecutions of Jewish Christians. Whatever the case may have been, after Stephen, it sort of became open season on the oppression of Christians in Jerusalem. Christians meaning Jews who had, who had believed that on Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They began to be oppressed and persecuted right here. And so they fled. They moved. And in the providence of God... They took the gospel outside of Jerusalem into surrounding Judea and Samaria. Now, some of you are thinking, I thought we were in James. We are beginning the book of James today. Why would we open our study on James by reading of Stephen in the book of Acts? Because as Acts 1 8 1 declares the stoning of Stephen sort of broke the dam of persecution against the church in Jerusalem a church that was composed almost entirely in 36 A.D. of believing Jews. There wasn't a Gentile around. James 1.1 says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes, what? Scattered among the nations. Greetings. The scattering you just read about. In Acts 8, 1. So James, the author of this letter and the half-brother of Jesus, he was the leader of that church, the Jerusalem church. He was one of the elders. And those scattered people were his brothers and sisters in Christ that sat under his teaching. They were his friends. And now they're gone. They're gone from his hearing, separate from his fellowship and influence. If you were one of those who fled Jerusalem at that time because of the persecution, and you had settled in the surrounding area in the region of Judea and Samaria, let's say you were some 20 or 30 miles away, well, back then you didn't just hop into Buick and drive 30 minutes to church. Uh, that wasn't an option. Neither could you just fire up the computer and listen to James' latest teaching online. Neither could you just move away and go to a, I'll go to a different church, so to speak. And, get this, these scattered people, they didn't have a Bible to read. There was no New Testament. And none, probably none, possessed the Old Testament either because those were precious rare and expensive scrolls they had to be copied by hand the local copy was kept in the local synagogue that's the jewish place of worship where none of these believers would have been welcomed so they had no car they had no bible They had no James. They had none of the apostles to teach and lead them. All they had was the Holy Spirit and each other, if they lived close enough, 
if they were scattered close enough. And they also had their memory of the Old Testament that they had been schooled in as children. And they had the apostles' teachings that they had heard since Pentecost, some ten or so years before. So think, okay? Think of James as the pastor and elder of the church in Jerusalem, his people scattered. How would James continue to disciple them, to teach them, to encourage them, to discipline, to admonish them? How would he do that? I mean, this is a a difficult, terrible circumstance. This is hard. Yeah, it is. What would he do? He'd write a letter. He would write what's known as a circular letter. It's not to a person. It's to all these people. It was a letter that was intended to be read in one town or vicinity by one group of scattered believers, and then the letter would be passed on to another town or region where other groups of Christians were organically doing life together. And here we see once again, basically, that persecution authored the Word of God. Right? Forced him to write. Sounds rough, doesn't it? I mean, to tell you, these scattered believers, they have no building to, to gather in. They don't have much organization. I mean, no bylaws, can you imagine? No membership classes, probably. No annual meeting. No pastor in the formal sense. Leadership would have had to well up by common people taking steps of faith to lead and to serve among these scattered people. I I used the word organic just a little bit ago. Think about that with me. This is this is these scattered people, this is organic church, which means it's totally unprocessed. It grows wild. It's it's like the underground church in China or in Iran or in North Korea. It's not like the church in America. Highly processed church. This isn't tame. It's not organized. It's raw faith exercised by untrained, untamed people in the fire of oppression and persecution. Common people all of them at this point, Old Covenant people that are now New Covenant believers in Jesus as Messiah, and that's not popular. This book, James, that we're going to be studying is probably the first book written in the New Testament. It was written early. Uh, Some would say as early as 45 to 50 A.D. Some say a little later. That's a, but if it's 45, that's a little more than 10 years after Jesus' resurrection. And there is, again, not a Gentile in sight. Meaning all the converts to Jesus at this point, almost all of them were Jews, old covenant law keepers. They had done the Passovers their whole lives. The, the sacrifices, the festivals, anticipating, they were anticipating the Messiah to come. We know this in the first century, man, people were, oh, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. He's due. The prophets say so. He'll take care of those nasty Romans. And then these people, these scattered believers, are realizing he came. The Jewish Messiah came, the forever king, and we killed him. We Jews used a Roman cross to kill our Jewish Messiah, the king of kings of Israel. These scattered Christians believed this. But then upon that humble faith that Jesus was and is the Messiah, then to realize that humble king came not to conquer and rule Tiberius Caesar. He came to conquer sin and death and to rule not in Rome, but in me. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. These scattered Christians believed he accomplished the fulfillment of prophetic mysteries like Ezekiel 36, 26, where the prophet Ezekiel writes, I will give you a new, a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and move you. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to, to keep my laws. And these scattered Christians to, to know this passage and others like it and to see this prophecy that they had experienced from Pentecost onward, the new birth. So they left. They left Jerusalem. They scattered, pushed by oppression and persecution, and in so doing, Persecution did for the church what Jesus had commanded before he left in Acts 1.8. He told them, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, my martyrios in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And in the mess of their circumstances, they took the message of the gospel out with them in their hearts. And that's the context of James. I think we'd be a, a bit remiss if we didn't talk some more about the first word in the book. James 1.1 1, 1 is on your screen. What's the first word? James. I told you he was the half-brother of Jesus. Let's look into that a little bit deeper. There are a number of Jameses in the Bible. There are four in the New Testament. Uh, two of the disciples, Jesus' 12 guys, were, were named James. And those are James of the most famous guy, James and John, sons of Zebedee, the inner three. They were fishermen by trade along with Peter. But there was another guy named James, also a disciple, James the son of Alphaeus. He's, he's just mentioned in the lists of who the disciples were a number of times in the Gospels. But he, he doesn't say anything. There's nothing recorded of what he said or did except as part of the group. We know almost nothing about this other James of Alpheus other than that he was one of the twelve. As to which James wrote the book we're considering, the best evidence would indicate that it was not James, the brother of John and the son of Zebedee. And one of the reasons that uh, people who've studied this uh, would say it wasn't him is because he was martyred according to Acts 12 1 which reads this way it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them he had James the brother of John put to death with the sword uh, we know that this happened somewhere around 44 AD making it impossible for this James the brother of John to have written the letter of James, since he was already dead. So Zebedee's son is not a good candidate for the authorship of our letter. And I want to spend some time, I think this is fascinating, to show you who it most probably was that wrote James. Okay? Which James was it? Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. What's his hometown, church? What? Nazareth. So when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. So Jesus is teaching in his hometown. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of, help me out here, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Verse 6 comments that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Matthew 13, 55, 58 has a similar uh, 
rendition of this. So at this point, folks, uh, in Jesus' ministry, Jesus' hometown, and perhaps even his own family members aren't thrilled about Jesus. But that's our guy. James, right there in the list. Jesus' half-brother. I take you to Mark 3.20. This is a little bit earlier. This is early on in Jesus' ministry. It says, Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. It's, it's just amazing uh, people everywhere. This is during Jesus' popularity. Verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he's out of his mind. That's our guy. James, part of that family. We got to go get him. He's woohoo. They think Jesus is crazy. And then there's John 7, verses 1 to 5. This is toward the middle of Jesus' public ministry. It says, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, up by the Sea of Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea, which is the region where it's the south part where uh, Jerusalem is, because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. See, the thing about the cross is, if Jesus didn't time it just right, they'd have killed him long before it was time. That's how great humankind is. He had to kind of hold it off there for a little while. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee, go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. Nobody who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. Kind of reminds me of Satan's temptation in the wilderness a little bit. Verse 5 says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. That's our guy right there. So obviously, during Jesus' time on earth, James doesn't appear to be a believer in Jesus as the Messiah of the Jewish people. So what happened? What changed his mind? What happened to make this guy a blood-bought, sold-out, utterly committed man of God, one who would worship Jesus, his half-brother, not as a family member, but as his Savior and his Lord? Let me show you what well, was one big thing that accounted for the miracle of James's faith and transformation and boldness. We see it in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the Apostle Paul writing. This is a great passage. You should all know this passage. Know it well, even to the point of memorizing. It was a key uh, statement of faith for the early church and one of the earliest passages of scripture paul writes now brothers and sisters i want to remind you of the gospel i preached to you i love that uh we all need reminding of the gospel don't we we think we know it yeah sure jesus died for my sins and that kind of is is sometimes our attitude toward it no that's not just the gospel the gospel is your life it's not just your your salvation and forgiveness. It is, it is the, the outpouring of the power that, that leads you and guides you and prompts you and motivates you with the joy to live that out in such a way that it's dynamically different than, than what the world offers. So he reminds, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you take your stand. By this gospel you're saved, Paul writes, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Don't miss that. He's saying this is the most important thing in your life. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the Twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Verse 7, then 
he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Now, he, he mentions James. This could not have been James, the brother of John, necessarily, because he would have been included as an apostle. Uh, same for James, son of Alphaeus. This James was most likely Jesus' half-brother, the one who wrote the letter we're going to be studying. The resurrected Christ appeared to James, and he believed. And this guy's passion... He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't one of the disciples of Christ. He was an unbeliever. But his passion for Christ as a believing, obedient Jew became so great that he became known. They called him James the Just. They also called him Camel Knees because he went to the temple and prayed so much on his knees for people. And for the believers in Jerusalem, that his knees got all calloused and crusty like the knees of a camel. He died in 62 A.D. According to Hegesippus, who was an early church historian, this is how he died, according to him. He was thrown off the temple they kind of tricked him. Some, someday in this series, I'm going to read to you exactly Hegesippus' account of how James died. I'm just going to summarize it for you. There's a, a picture right there on your screen of some artist's portrayal of James. He's often portrayed that way, and he's holding that thing. Here's why. He was thrown off the temple. The fall didn't kill him. Uh, he rose to his knees to pray for his killers who promptly began to stone him. One of the Jewish leaders tried to stop it. He said, stop! Can't you you hear he's praying for you? But another of them would have none of it. He took a club and he used it a club used to beat carpets and tapestries and things, and he bashed him in the head as he was praying. Beat his brains out. What a what a mess, you know. <laughs> Scattered by persecution and oppression. Scattered believers martyred their leader. But what a message. The gospel. That that God-loving, spirit-empowered people. Listen to my words. They're very intentional. Are free enough. Free enough. To pray for their killers. Doesn't get any more free than that. That they could pray for their killers as they give up their lives and their livelihoods for Christ. So as as a soft brand of totalitarianism presses hard on this country, maybe presses, maybe we could say, lightly at this point and upon us I would ask you what are you going to do if that continues if it worsens the way I see it we have uh, at least five options only one of which is worthy and only one of which is miraculous Let me list them for you and then I'll briefly describe them. What are we going to do? Well, uh, we can throw up, we can mess up, we can shut up, we can give up, or we can stand up. And what I mean by those is we can throw up with worry. Some people look around and are so worried and so nervous and so 
ring in their hands. These are believers. And oh, our country's falling apart. And it just, I can't sleep at night. Well, you can throw up with worry, I guess. But I don't think that's the Holy Spirit prompting that. Or we can shut up, or we can mess up with sin. Some people, some professing Christians just join in with it. You know, I might as well have some fun with this, you know. The world's going to hell in a handbasket anyway. So we'll just mess up with sin, fit in with everybody else. Or we can shut up with fear. I just won't say anything. I'm going to lay to low. Me and Jesus, we're just going to stay in the shadows and we won't stir the pot. Or we could give up with despair and depression. Just get utterly discouraged. Throw up, mess up, shut up, give up, or we can stand up with the courageous power of the Holy Spirit knowing, listen to my words, that suffering proves you are free. And perseverance in suffering is the way that you live free in Christ. And that's a pretty good way to take us into next week to the beginning of the text as I read it for you now. James chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. As we've set the context, both of, both as of James a little bit and, and those who received his letter, his scattered people that he could no longer face-to-face fellowship with, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Begin there next week. Father, you are good even when we suffer and struggle, whether it's internal struggles or whether it's struggles from without. It pressures us to blame you when we examine that way of thinking it reveals a faith in you that's about as deep as um, believing in you because we want you to do good stuff for us and make life good and easy that is not the history of the church, the true church, at all. Uh, It may be American culture and American Christendom, but it is not the blood-bought church. Uh, Father, help, help us to And I know that you will, that your Holy Spirit will be active and at work as I pray that you'd raise up, stir among us, that we could we would read this this letter over and over again, uh, that you'd sear it into our hearts and minds uh, as you've been doing for me. Um, And I just pray that uh, we'd be faithful uh, to study it, to allow it to to challenge the way we have been thinking about faith and life. And I pray that you would use it to prepare us uh, for uh, whatever uh, may be on the horizon as um, freedom seem to be eroding and control uh, seems to be on the increase and coercion. Uh, Help us to live free to be free so that we can live free. And thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Please stand.
We're going to sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer again together. benediction of uh, Philippians 3. Uh, Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Thanks for coming. God bless.